Hello and welcome to The Federal. This is Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay and you're watching Off the Beaten Track in which we pick up one issue and go to the depth of that matter, not just remain on the surface. I'm going to be talking about the changing nature of urban architecture in Delhi, specifically to begin with what is impending in Delhi is the demolition of the National Museum and several other buildings which have been landmarks for last several decades of independence, since independence. I'm going to be discussing these issues, the changing architecture of what we call the Modi era throughout the country, not just in India. It has started from Gujarat and it has arrived virtually everywhere with Mr. Jawar Sarkar, who is a member of Rajya Sabha. Uh, he represents the uh, All India Trinamool Congress from West Bengal. Prior to getting into public life, he had been a member of the Indian Administrative Service for several decades, right from 1975 onwards. His last uh, position within the government was as the CEO of the, uh, as the chairman of the Prasar Bharti. Uh, he's also been from a very important years, 2008 to 2012, the Secretary of the Ministry of Culture. And we are going to be talking primarily about the changing architecture and the changing culture of this country. Uh, let me begin with you straight away with the impending demolition of the National Museum and also Vigyan Bhavan, which, if I'm not wrong, is virtually just across the road from where you live in the house allotted to you as member of parliament by the government. Demolitions have been very central to the politics of the current political regime. I do not have to elaborate on that. But I would like to know from you that why is it that the impending demolition of the National Museum appears to be very worrying. It raises questions not just about the decision to erase a building, but also the nature of museum. Then how will the artifacts which are kept here be kept? Where will they be shifted? And above all, it raises questions about curating a museum. Who does it and with what perspective? I'd like to hear your opening comments on this entire gamut of issues. Babe, uh, as you put it rightly, demolition is part of the agenda of this government in the sense that uh, A, it wants to obliterate uh, collective memory which has a large degree of memory of the colonial period. Now, one cannot wish away one's history. That's the best part. I mean, if by demolishing a colonial era building, you feel that you could demolish the entire colonial period, uh, that is being in 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 I mean, every nation in the world uh, forbears, tolerates, sometimes uh, prides, in buildings of previous hostile eras. So it's it's part of the continuum of history. But in any case, uh, among the buildings that are slated for demolition, the National Museum deserves special recognition. Uh, unfortunately, those who appear to be at the helm of affairs are not educated enough or sensitized enough to realize that the National Museum is not like breaking down Shastri Bhavan. Pack all files in 17 crates, mark them, take them, dump them somewhere, and restore them back if possible. It's not that. Break down the tables, take down the electric wiring, sell them for a concession and say they were destroyed, and do whatever you feel like. Take down priceless paintings and sell them in the black market, whatever happens during shiftings. I mean, the CPWD is notorious for it, notorious for it. There's no track of what happens. Now, if this is taken to be one more CPWD demolition so that Mr. Modi and his completely, um, what shall I say, completely highly overrated uh, and underperforming uh, pet architect, poodle architect, I use the word poodle architect, I think he has chosen taking some 230 crores of our money for just designing it. Now, the entire thing has been lopsided, but again, I'm tempted to get into the Central Vista, but I'll refrain and return back to the National Museum. The National Museum 
unlike the Indian Museum, was not an organic institution. Mm -hmm. The Indian Museum started as a storehouse for imperial treasures, for curiosities that imperial officials and others had collected, not necessarily for imperial purposes, for studying, for academic reasons. And through these materials, they reconstructed the history of India, and undubitably so, open to challenge. Right. It was peer-reviewed for centuries, and we have a fair understanding that this history a large part of it, which stems from the material culture displayed at the Indian Museum, is actually the history of India, without too much feelings involved in it. Now, the National Museum, on the other hand, was not an organic growth. The National Museum was the collection that had been kept in the Viceregal Lodge, uh, a building or a palace much too large for any requirement, a building that boasted of imperial glory without having the capacity to make proper utilization of the building. In fact, I would much rather say that Rashtrapati Bhavan makes a better utilization of that vice legal lodge uh, mm -hmm. for, for national or patriotic purposes, for the simple reason that the bureaucracy has also grown. Now, this collection that was kept in the vice legal lodge, along with collections kept here and there, required a house. So much of the National Museum had the capacity to know what were the artifacts that were getting in and plan to a large degree around the artifact, which is the modern way of museum building. The Indian Museum, on the other hand, had buildings and then artifacts coming in. You know, there's a difference because uh, there's a difference. Now, the National Museum was meant for about a hundred thousand. It has now come to two lakh two hundred thousand plus. Many of these artifacts are very, very fragile. Number one, many of these artifacts are irreplaceable. Right, that highly over discussed dancing girl yes. of Mahanjadar, for instance, is the first example of Siridipu that is lost wax process sculpture anywhere in the world. Number one. Number two, its features reveal, physical features, reveal a lot about the physical features of the people of those times. So we get a fire estimate that can be compared to genetic materials. Right. C, its artistic design pose. D, the metallurgy that went into it. So I won't get into a few inch doll, but that doll uh, or that sculpture itself is something that would require people whose uh, education certificates are carefully hidden. Uh, I mean, I don't mind them uh, not being adequately educated because education is not only formal education, can you, can but we... the sensitivity that needs to come in. Uh, Akbar was not highly educated. Uh, and Akbar's sensitivities and uh, cultural uh, propensities are very well known. Now, they just don't have it in them. The minister is way out of depth there. He would much rather fight the factional wars of uh, Telangana. He is in high demand there now. He, he has shown absolutely no interest. And the, and the Noida doctor who preceded him have uh, had absolutely no interest in the subject, nor do the MOSS, despite the pretensions of one. But the whole team does not know what it's up to. The bureaucrats of the Ministry of Culture, unfortunately, have not been quarreling types like us. Many of us had very strong quarrels with the ministers. Of course, we don't go out and tom tom it in the market, but because of certain reasons. So what's happening is he connived that collapse. Number one, many of the artifacts in the National Museum require, what shall I say, ICU treatment. Continuous right. ICU treatment, and they are given continuous ICU treatment. They are they have to be kept in conditions cleaner than heart wards. Number one, for them to survive, and so that future generations come to know. Many of the artifacts require many many. In fact, most of the artifacts require uh, different sets of 
different sets of preservation conditionality. Number one, a preservation conditionality would entail uh, a, a suitable place, sometimes dust-free, sometimes covered to prevent dust. Number two, light. Mm. The Mughal miniatures were subjected stupidly by CPWD to glaring lights, which absorbed a lot of the paint, which destroyed a lot of the paint once upon a time until PWD was broken out of its sheer stupidity to explain that it's not these lights. Nor, do, nor does LED automatically make it better. So there are specialized lights for uh, color sensitive objects. That is the way it is done in these objects are thermosensitive. Heat sensitive. Remember, the tropics are punishing. Tropics are punishing. So I've put it in summary. The heat, the thermal uh, requirements, the light, um, the light, the dust, and all told, they require special categories of treatment. Number one, you don't even know where the hell it's going. Right. Which go down of Noida or Greater Noida or... Uh, Guru Gram or uh, Bhagwan Gram, you are going to send it. Number one. Number two, you have to. Sh I I have no. I am not aware of any such building available in the N city or beyond. I have spent almost twenty years there, and I am aware of what's going on more or less. You mm -hmm. may have unoccupied housing estates. But for God's sake, this is not meant for an unoccupied housing estate or a building. To save that promoter from disaster by hiring his premises. No, it doesn't happen that way. That's criminal. So you have to come up with a white paper and tell us where are you taking it? Is it worth the risk? Is it, is it worth the risk? I've not even discussed transportation. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's something that's beyond the, beyond the comprehension of many an ignoramus who decides policy. It's complete. That's the tragic part of it. It, it was like Muhammad bin Tughlaq decided in 1327 to move the entire city of Delhi and whip the whole lot out, killing a few lakhs on the way. And then 12 years later decides, no, Delhi was better and he kills the remaining half of the population. It requires that amount of absolute arrogance com with, combined with stupidity if I to may, come to decision. Can I, can I just pose a question at this stage. You talked about that beyond comprehension. There's been another issue on which there has been beyond comprehension, the new parliament building. Suddenly in December 2020, bang in the middle of the pandemic when India as a nation was so very unsure of its future, uh, the foundation stone of the new parliament building was laid and then it was inaugurated on the 28th of May this year, which incidentally was also the 140th birth anniversary of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, somebody who was an accused in the Gandhi assassination case and is considered to be an ideologue of the Sangh Parivar. Uh, very recently, during this special session of uh, uh, parliament, you uh, had uh, you were uh, you know one of the people who went in and actually saw it, probably for the first time. Uh, first of all, the question about that whether there was any need to shift from the old and build a new parliament building, the reasons given, an assessment of that, that it was old, decaying, uh, you know, not earthquake proof, etc., etc., and also becoming very small for an expanded parliament. The other is that what has actually the building revealed? What does it show? Does it have the openness about the old parliament building or does it have a completely closed atmosphere? What kind of messaging, what kind of symbolism does it uh, you know, offer for you? See, I have been uh, speaking about uh, asking questions, embarrassing questions That's right. to an uh, inadequately uh, equipped minister uh, whose ego takes over, whose, uh, whose uh, propensity to, to serve the regime is beyond his uh, competence otherwise. I've been asking the minister again and again and again, and he has been stonewalling. I'm using the word stonewalling the questions because I can show the list of something like uh, 17 or 18 questions I asked, and none of them appeared to be on the list. So that that's a story by itself there. Mm -hmm. 17 or 18 very well-prepared uh, questions. Number two, I wrote... Uh, to him several times, countless times, to receive rebuffs 
in uh, reasonably poor taste, uh, not expected for someone who claims to have those educational degrees. Uh, but the short not point is, uh, whatever I'm doing is right. But the grand plan behind the new parliament is not the uh, antiquity of the old one. Right. Not even the colonial origins of the old one. The grand plan behind it is to increase the number of seats and leave a little for extras also as well. Uh, one of the ways in which you can diminish a line is draw a bigger line. So the existing line looks uh, looks inadequate, looks smaller, looks irrelevant. And that's a Birbalian line, as we call it. So this was a bit of Birbalian architecture where uh, the existing numbers in the old parliament building were overshadowed by larger numbers and a building uh, made more like a coliseum, more like a coliseum rather than as a discussion parliament. I mean, we feel so distant to each other. It's almost like we require mics to shout at each other. Really? It's one of the poorest form of parliamentary architecture that one can ever conceive. The United Nations building also has uh, tall atriums, but tall atriums doesn't mean uh, seats at uh, great distance. You know what I mean? So, I mean, the, the entire architecture is by somebody who's just not there, the just not, is propelled by uh, parochialism, by parochialism, other forms of proximity, God knows what else, to build it. Now, the number of seats there have been designed to be extra to take, uh, to execute the next master plan that this gentleman has. And the next master plan is to ensure the domination of the Hindi speaking states, many of which actually would like to come out of this nomenclature and have applied to the president to be considered as languages in their own right. So there has been a lot of road rollering and homogenization to bring in a large number of 43% as Hindi speaking. Uh, there are about 20% of these speakers who, as I said, are on record saying that we have our own autonomy that is being ground to dust to, 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 to name us and brand us as Hindi speaking. Now, uh, there is a there is a well thought of plan to increase the number of seats as per the first census to be conducted after the, after the new parliament, after this uh, 26 ban, uh, which in the normal course would be uh, 2031. Right. And if you see the projections that are going on, and if they manage to badger a few more uh, <coughs> regional languages and term them to be Hindi, they would have either an absolute majority or a commanding presence. Technology That's the whole thing. You know, what the homogeneous identity of Indian culture that Narendra Modi dreams of, though he is a sidekick in this culture, remember, he doesn't belong to that culture. He yanks on to the culture as Macedonian Alexander had yanked on to the culture of Greece. He yanks on to this culture as Corsican Napoleon had yanked, he had yoked himself to the culture, greater culture of France. And it, it is an outlier complex, uh, which, which makes it more vicious, makes it more vicious. The whole idea is to stupefy India with numbers and then legitimize the rule of an homogenic language and culture. It doesn't happen that way, but that's his grand plan. The lack of education comes in so, so, so apparently at every stage that his binary thinking would be, would be overshadowed by fuzzy realities. But he you doesn't know, realize. You mentioned the central... Matter. So ah. that is the main. Architecture, incidentally, is worse than horrible. I have described it in an article in the wire on the last day of parliament when we were leaving. I have read the that. architecture is in one word horrible. There are excess spaces where there are no requirements. There are huge, as I said, amphitheater type halls kept in where proximity and uh, let us say uh, where where dialogue bond 
are separated by berlin walls it the practical berlin walls so we don't see each other common uh, common uh, areas have been destroyed so as per divide and rule principle and it's it's a, it's a, it's a horror of an experience horror of an experience when you for one who has come from the other house you were talking about Tell this hmm. vista you know this is all part of the new plan of central vista now let me remind this is something we forget quite often mm. that actually the central vista was first rolled out in gandhi nagar you know when mr modi was the chief minister that is the time when this huge convention center was built at the end of this wide road which is also called the central vista in gandhi nagar now there at the convention center on one side was the convention center on the other side was the state legislature now it kind of you know brought about some kind of an equivalence with a convention center and the legislature likewise here we also have seen the recent uh, inauguration and the g20 summit held at this huge uh, you know uh, architectural monstrosity called bharat mandapam which is also takes it closer to what was there in the mind of lutians you know that right from the uh, capital hill right from the raisina hill all the way till where the yamuna flows you had was supposed to have a pathway so, so pragati maidan what used to be pragati maidan uh, was possible is the, possibly the closest that one can get to the bank of the yamuna so it you know do you see what was tried out in gandhi nagar you know was in some way kind of an experimentation and now we are seeing this on a full scale we have seen similar kind of experimentations you know in varanasi also where uh you know the uh, kashi vishwanath temple corridor right from the temple to the gandhi ghat has been done everything else has been cleared out this fascination for clean wide uh you know characterless uh straight roads leading from one place to another place you know to glorify something or the past you know do you see certain amount of commonality between all these uh, experiments uh in india or in most parts of asia uh didn't have the concept of a central plaza right the central plaza or the piazza is a very european concept where residences would congregate onto an institutional area and in the center of the institutional area would be even without institutional area would be a wide area for convergence for people to meet for people to converse this plaza concept was not there certain parts and certain villages in north india had what they call the lal dohra area hmm. other than that the central area this concept is alien it is more colonial than anything that you can imagine if you talk of colonialism and colonialism colonial architecture is part of the colonial legacy number one number two kingsway or rajpath or bodhipath or whatever you call it is basically a marching a marching avenue the avenue in which goose stepping soldiers march with every step they trample upon the pulsating heart of democracy right with every step they 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 pulsate over the heart of democracy so there's something antithetical to it the european civilization also had this grand arch through which victorious soldiers would march through like the at the triumph and many other arc which was an act of simulated penetration if you think of it it's it's an act of it's a very patriarchal concept so these grand marching avenues are per se anti democratic anti pluralistic anti they they are number 2 the way he is going on marauding and mauling whatever is left of the two sides is not only shocking but something that we would have to bear with we would have to perhaps have to fatehpur secret make it at make it at as an, as as there it's there and sorry sorry i mean there it for to this purpose the two the stodgy nine buildings stone clad nine buildings first of all i i i worked in the bureaucracy for about 41 years and about 17 of it in the central bureaucracy i have worked from building to building and nowhere have bureaucrats ever voiced the need for having 
their buddies next to each other. We get into a building, we do our work, we meet people, we call meetings, you carry files, take decisions, go to ministers, and that's it. I don't need, as a, as, as a director in commerce, I had no necessity for having, let us say, the Ministry of War, the Ministry of Defense next to me. Right. Hmm. It is somebody with a helicopter view at the top, who imagines he's on a helicopter ride, a very Genghis Khan attitude, who feels that all his minions must work together. Right. I wonder what's going to happen when you have uh, 50, uh, 50 lakh government employees all in one place and they go on strike. In the same place. They'll remember him for facilitating it. So the, it's, a, it's a disaster in its own right. With the Prime Minister's residence and office also within the same, you know, com, you know same area, same region. You know, the... You know, uh, he is up on no. There are there are two parts of of the imperial thought of uh, of uh, uh, what do you call Central Vista. There is Mount Zeus at one end. Right. Hmm, that's Capitol Hill at one end. There is Raisina Hill at one end, from which the masters look down upon humanity. So you had central to it the concept of the Viceregal Lodge turned into Rashtrapati Bhavan. On the left and right were what we call the core institutions of the deep state. On the left and right, North Block and South Block contains only those departments and ministries that are intrinsic part of the deep state. Right. The deep state, the hard state, the brutal state, state as it's viewed by those repressed. There are state has a lot of other developmental functions that lie beyond. Agriculture is there, culture, there's all lots of things, but they are. If you notice, the denizens of North and South Bloc, home, foreign affairs, defense, finance, the central armed forces, all of them represent the core. But every nation in its own way requires a part of the this deep so-called deep state, however we view it. Modi has, Mr. Modi has ensured that he is up on Mount Zeus or Mount Olympus. The right. Mount for Zeus, the Mount Olympus. He is on. Sorry, my mistake. Mount Olympus. He is there on Mount Olympus, and he is there next to Zeus, and he's carrying with him his favorite vice president, who 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 whose words flutter to explain right. how great a man Modi is. So the vice president will also be there, next to him. The president is al already there. And after that, we have the two pincers of the deep state next to it. I don't know how they may have planned to convert the, those two buildings into meant museum. for bureaucrats in, into museum. They, they, into, they intend it's to be museums. And, and what would mm -hmm. be put in these museums is a big question mark. You know, these uh, academicians actually raise the issue of curating museums, that curating museums is actually the job of experts, not of bureaucrats not of political leaders. That is how it was done. Always, when after independence, India started uh, raising, you know, making new museums. Now, we have seen all this happening in the urban space, you know, which you have also, you gave a very important speech uh, earlier this year in Rajya Sabha, where you talked about urban architecture in the Modi era. You find uh, links, commonalities with it happening in the field of education, in the field of history, rewriting of Indian history, uh, which is definitely one of the priorities of this government, uh, change of the education policy, the new education policy. I was listening very recently once again to some experts saying that as to how they are going to completely put an end to specialized education in the country and make everybody just generalists coming out from our various educational institutions. So you feel any link between education, history, various other disciplines in the educational sector and what is happening on the streets of urban India? First, the debasement of thought, belief and progress, the debasement of science, the deliberate abuse of science at every step, the deliberate distortion of science at every step has been very clear. I need not elaborate on that. But then when you talk of the new buildings, any commonality, a bhakt 
there are many of them, dime a dozen, explained to me that it is a new Hindu architecture. I know a bit of architecture and I asked him what Hindu architecture. Right. First of all, tell me what Hindu architectures are there in the secular domain. I am not talking of temple architectures. Temple architectures or church architectures are a different, a different ball game altogether. We may at best borrow the dome on top, that's all. Right. Or a few motifs on the side, like bell. What secular architecture are we modeling this on? What secular Hindu architecture are we modeling and refining into Hindu architecture phase Modi? Mm -hmm. There was no answer. The finest of Hindu architecture that we see is actually secular architecture. Secular architecture is actually from Modi state and Rajasthan and others where you see the step wells, the baulis. Right. The step wells. They have, they have an essence of it. So if they had even that backing coming up in a new variation, we could call it a Hindu architecture phase two. Now, look at Bharat Mandapam. It looks something like a, something like a UFO landing. Exactly. It looks like a UFO. You for landing, it looks like one of the circular restaurants that are a dime a dozen all over the world. A circular restaurant on top. Aesthetically very it, jarring. Huh? Uh, it, it, jarring. it is meant to overaw the overall, but it it not only underaws, it it's a waste of both men, materials, and money, just for an ego. The Hall of Nations was always acclaimed as a marvelous pet specimen of brutalist architecture. To replace it with this horrendous piece is, is something uh, we just can't. The old parliament building, except the colonnades, had everything was indigenous. I mean, I can take, uh, take yes, a can. whole session on that, why I got it. But this particular building is a four-star hotel by the Nouvourish, who have made money from coal allocations and from airport undercuts and from ports on prohibited land and stuff like that. Well, this the convention center and culture of entitlement. Had... Huh? You know, just, just adding a bit, you know, the convention center in Gandhinagar is now managed by a very important, a uh, very large uh, hotel chain of the country. So that is what is happening. You know that we are, uh, you know, giving these what we call five it. star, uh, you know, stamp to it and this taking it away from the poor people of India. The five-starism emanates from a very deep inferiority complex in an uneducated person who uh, who who is fretting at uh, his place in the social hierarchy, who's fretting at his inadequacies and covers them up with an uh, with an with a violent arrogance. That's that's the whole thing. It's a the violent arrogance comes out. And he tries to take refuge by Maybach uh, cars and Bulgari, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, eyeglasses and pinstripe suits. He is somehow desperate to prove to the oligarchs and to the capitalist class, Ki, I am you, I am your creator, I am your savior, I love your culture. I love your culture. But whenever required, he takes off all these embellishments and says, me throw, and comes back to the people. He is just a connector between the masses and the electorate and the oligarchical capitalist class. That's all. There's no two things about it. So one last question. There was a joke, incidentally. There was a joke, a stand-up comedian who said, Ariyar, if I have to vote, let me vote for the oligarch. Right. Why are you coming in? Maybe the answer lies that oligarchs can't come up and say Mitra and air ignorance in the name of oratory. Uh, one last question. Uh, mm. The Indian capital, earlier it used to be called Delhi. In 1911, mm. after it was decided that uh, to, a new city would be built and the Indian capital will be shifted from Kolkata to here in Delhi, a new Delhi came up. Then we started calling a the score part of New Delhi as Lutians Delhi or Latians Delhi. Uh, do you think that in years to come, in decades to come, something would be remembered as Modi's Delhi? 
That is the effort. He, for the he, his, uh, his fascination has now become a neurotic obsession. It now falls in the category of OCD. It's an obsessive compulsive disorder for him to be placed somewhere in Indian history. What he doesn't realize is all this maulings and devastation that he's inflicting in Varanasi, in there, here, there, Delhi and others, was simply unrequired. Because in any case, it takes a few years for the people of India to make up their mind. After GST and demonetization and such other brilliant acts, people have given him a place in history next to Muhammad bin Tughlaq. The rest of it is superfluous. He has earned a place in history next to Muhammad bin Tughlaq. I've repeated this again and again and again, that he mm -hmm. has a place in history. Why would you deny him a place in history? He has a place in history next to Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Somebody said next to Aurangzeb. I said Aurangzeb would walk out from that place. But next to Muhammad bin Tughlaq, he has it. The rest of it is how to keep himself occupied for the residual part. Well, uh, that's all. It's fairly controversially put, uh, Mr. Sarkar, but thank you very much for coming and joining us. Your yeah. views have been very harsh on the Prime Minister uh, without uh, directly taking his name, but you have actually not. Yeah, on few occasions, you did take his name. Uh, it's not uh, our job to judge whether your opinion is uh, correct or not, but it definitely communicates a very important viewpoint. Thank you very much for coming and joining us on this program. Subscribe to the Federal's YouTube page for more news and updates.